Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian. This Yoder. is Jordan Harbinger. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. I'm Krista Vernon. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Richard Bronson, and you are listening to the Break It Down Show. And now the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. Terrific. Seventy million people in the United States have a criminal record. That's one in three adults. Once again, 70 million people have a criminal record in this country. One of them is Richard Bronson. He was a partner at the infamous Wolf of Wall Street firm Stratton Oakmont, which was the subject of a 2013 Martin Scorsese movie. Richard served 22 months in a federal prison for security fraud, and once he was released, even as a white man in the corporate world with a college education, he had a hard time finding a job, so he founded the company 70 Million Jobs. You can reach him at 70, the word million, the word jobs dot com. If you are one of the guys out there who's got a criminal record and has a hard time applying your skills in the job market, Richard, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, guys. What a great mission. Yeah, uh, I'm a lucky guy. Uh, I discovered my calling in life late in life. But uh, I love coming to work every day. You know, we're a for-profit venture, so we definitely do want to make a lot of money and build a big successful business. But we're after what they call double bottom line returns. In addition to having a successful business, we're interested in doing massive social good. Personally, I have a kind of a quest. I want to get a million people jobs. And if I can do that... I will have a successful business for sure, and I will uh, have moved the needle, or my team and I will have moved the needle significantly. So I feel blessed that I can pursue my passion and also hopefully you know, do well earning a living. Can you tell us how far you've gotten into that one million people with jobs? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we got, we got a ways to go. I launched the company about nine months ago uh, in New York, where I'm from, and almost immediately upon launching, the city of Los Angeles, in your neck of the woods, kind of reached out to me because the mayor there is very interested in this space, and we're looking to increase employment opportunities among that city's formerly incarcerated population. So uh, among whom there are many, among whom there are many, as a matter of fact, it's the largest uh, population of people walking around with records of any city uh, in the world. Um, In any event, uh, uh, I worked closely with the city for about three or four months. And then can I just slow you down for a minute? Because I want to punctuate that point. You said that Los Angeles is the city that's got the highest population of folks with a criminal record walking around in the world. Did yeah, that's, that right? a, that's a pretty, yes, you did. That's a pretty s- sad statistic, uh, and I guess it's worth underlining it somewhat. Um, we, and, uh, as Americans in America, we have approximately 5% of the world's population, yet we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population, um, 500% more than we really should. Uh, and that includes co- wonderful countries like China and North Korea and Afghanistan and Russia and wherever else you want to choose. Um, our record in criminal justice is abysmal, embarrassing. Um, what we do to people who are in prison Uh, What we do to juveniles in prison, we're the only country that puts juveniles in solitary confinement. We'll put a young 17 or 16-year-old kid in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day and then wonder why when he gets out, he's not, you know, his screws are a little loose. Uh, We do a terrible job uh, in preparing people for release, and the statistics bear that out. There is a almost 80 percent, eight out of 10 people who are incarcerated 
will return to jail or prison within five years of their release. 80%. What's that number when you get out past five years too? I mean, let's say you just go out and you struggle for three of those years. And then shortly after that, you've done something because the transition was untenable for you. Well, that, that it, it typically, uh, actually, within three years, two thirds or 66% of people will recidivate. So typically, it doesn't take very long. Um, you know, it, it generally happens within a year. It almost sometimes it happens within days or weeks or months. Um, you put somebody back out on the street with no way to earn a living, with no support system, with no learning, with no trade, with no nothing. And, you know, particularly when people are incarcerated when they're young and they have no role models and they have no experience in leading a, you know, uh, a legitimate life free of crime. Uh, and then you push them out with no resources at all. I left prison. I used to be rich. I used to have all kinds of opportunity. I knew everyone, you know, and everybody wanted to be in business with me. But going through the criminal justice system and my own personal journey, I came out of prison destitute. I had no prospects, no jobs. My friends had largely disappeared. Thank God I had a sister with a couch or else I would have had no place to live. <laughs> Right. And and that was and as as you mentioned in the intro, I knew I was lucky compared to my brothers who I left in prison, who were mostly young men of color, who you know uh, honestly we talk about giving people second chances. Arguably, most people in prison never really had a first chance because the only uh, examples they had around them were people who were breaking the law. And those were the people who were making money and having fun and, and hanging out with pretty girls and buying nice things. So it's not hard to imagine if that's all you see around you and that's your image of success, how you might follow down that path. They didn't have friends who were going to college. They didn't have people who knew how to get legitimate jobs. They knew how to do what they needed to do to survive on the streets. And then you come out and you ask somebody, okay, here's your alternative. Go get a job at McDonald's for minimum wage doing miserable work. And guess what? You're going to have the door slammed on your face even by McDonald's. Tell me how long any of us would put up with that until we went back to the lifestyle that we knew better where our friends still were, where they were making a lot of money and having a lot of fun. I got news for you. I can't imagine that I would have done anything differently. So the rate of recidivism is staggering, and it is about the only thing that Democrats and Republicans can agree on is how screwed up the whole system is. That's heavy yeah, shit, I, mean, I know, but it's true. On. It's a lot to chew on. It, it is a lot to chew on. Yeah. I'm a private investigator. My specialty is criminal defense. And I have a brother who's a corrections officer. And he and I get along fabulously. And a lot of people wonder, well, how can you guys work both sides of the fence like that? And do you feel bad that you're helping uh, guys defend themselves in court from criminal prosecution? And the answer to that is absolutely not. I do not feel bad because most of the cases that I see are exactly as you described. Either guys who had no chance and what I'm just trying to get them is away from the harshest penalty of a mistake that they made. Now, the mistake that you made cost you 22 months in federal prison. And $100 million. You know, uh, <laughs> well, that's, that's a bit costly. There um, is that. But like you said, you, you were very wealthy at the time. What they did was they took everything that you had. Yep. In my case, I had no excuse I knew what I was doing was wrong. I had plenty of options. I could have been patient. I could have taken the high road. I chose not to. Absolutely my fault. I don't compare myself at all with most of the people who go through the criminal justice system. I'm ashamed of what I did. I wake up every single day ashamed and sad because this was not what I was put on this earth to do. This is not what my parents had in mind. I brought no pride to my family's name. And I beat myself up over it terribly. I've paid back every person who ever lost a nickel at my hand. But still in all, 
I'm a Buddhist. I believe you get what you give. And I put out into the universe bad stuff. And I went to prison. Everybody in prison claims they're innocent. I was the one guy saying uh-huh. I was guilty. And no, I deserved it. Was it. Me. <laughs> it was me. So that is a hell know. of an admission. Well, it's, it's only part of me trying to be honest with my life when I wasn't so honest before. I mean, I, I want to go to heaven. And I'm deeply concerned about my karma. I'm deeply concerned about trying to do the right thing. And I'm deeply concerned, as I say, about my brothers and sisters who are still rotting away in prison and their prospects of getting out are so slim. So I figure if I could do a little bit, maybe the karmic balance, I could tip a little bit more in my favor. But you're right. Most of the people in prison are, first of all, they're about 80% are men, by the way. So when I say guys, I'm not trying to be sexist here. Women are much smarter than men, so they can avoid going to prison probably. But they're mostly 85% or so are men of color, you know, Hispanic or African American, and by far and away the greatest crimes percentage-wise are drug-related crimes, and many of them that I knew are in prison for dealing in pot, which here in California has been legalized. And yet now their lives have been largely ruined and they're walking around with the tag of being a felon for something that nobody considers even a crime anymore. And, you know, the irony of it, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be laughable. Yeah, that's true. One of the things I wonder... Our system, we have this penal-based system. A lot of the countries you talk about, Afghanistan, really has a civil-based system. But the reality is, like you said, we have this enormous prison population, privatization of prisons to meet the demand of the court that's creating all these prisoners and then sending them back to jail again and again. Uh, primarily men of color, as you've noted. And we've had Devone Bogan on the show, and he looked at, like, from the from okay you're in san quentin how did you get here what does your life look like and run it all the way back to the streets and he started trying to take the the worst 25 people in richmond or in stockton now in sacramento and he's like let's do these things that never happened let's get you the help you need you know let's you identify where you want to put yourself in two years three years we're going to walk you through a program it's slow deliberate steady work and the output is a stable, calm, boring, you know, person who's like, I am a heavy equipment union member. I work every day and I have a stable life. You're taking a different path on this. Talk a little bit about how you figured out what that path was. Hang on one second before we go there. I have to ask you this very important question because you issued one hell of an admission. Knowing what you know now and the fact that you wake up and that you have the mission that you have now, Richard, would you trade it? Would I trade? Would I have done it again if I have the, the if I had the chance again? Yeah. You know, it's a great question. You know, I'd like to think that I wouldn't. That knowledge is wasted on the young, but I wasn't that young when I was getting into trouble. And it was, trust me, you saw the movie. It was a lot of fun. The life I led. Intoxicating. Had to be intoxicating. Literally intoxicating most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with, with beautiful women far out of my league and incredible cars and incredible homes and incredible private jets. And wherever you go, people want to be your friend. They throw themselves at you one way or the other. And it does incredible things for your ego. But listen, the ego is a tricky thing. And it'll get into trouble more times than not. And it'll make you convince yourself that everybody is doing what you're doing and you're the smarter than the next guy and you won't get caught and whatever. But I always knew I was going to get caught and I always knew it was the wrong thing. So I don't feel like I really deserve a break, honestly. I wasn't tricked into doing anything. I did everything with my eyes open. Would I do it again? I just mean from the standpoint of the fact that you now seem like you have a tremendous mission. And like you said, you found your calling late. But Mm -hmm. the fact is that many people out there are walking around having not ever found a calling. Yeah. You have one. And it's an enormous mission. The fact that there were people that you had hurt and that you had to pay back and, and all of those things 
that's tough to wake up with. But the fact is, you do have a mission. Is that yeah. mission so important to you that you would say, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be? That very much resonates with me. People often ask me, you know, which mistake would you do over and in retrospect and all that kind of stuff. And you're absolutely right. Ultimately, I think we're all a sum of our experiences, both good and bad, mistakes, noble acts, whatever. And all of that stuff brought me to where I am now. And time will tell if I, if over time I'm able to achieve, you know, uh, at up to a magnitude of two or three or 10 times the negativity that I added to the universe, you know, not to get too cosmic about the whole thing, but I really and truly hope that my existence now stands for something that's good and helpful. And I, I don't really know, you know, I, I will tell you that for me, prison, going to prison was probably a good thing because it starts teaching you a little bit about humility. It's hard to be a big shot when you're scrubbing the toilets of a hundred men that you're living on top of. And I like to think I have a little more compassion for people. Um, I, you know, what I'm most sad about or embarrassed about is being a jerk and being an egomaniac and making belittling people because they weren't as successful or they drive, you know, a car that wasn't, you know, so nice or, or they were leading a life that I thought was just kind of average or mediocre. Uh, I'm very embarrassed by that. I'm embarrassed, you know, at waiters that I was rude to or, you know, things like that that I can point to. And, and you know, I, I, I have no desire to ever repeat that, you know, and I'm sorry about that. I try every day. It's a challenge for me. Believe me, I'm not, you know, I, I talk a good game, but I still have a long way to go. I wake every, up every morning just trying to be a better man than I was the day before. And some days I win that battle, some days I don't. But I am where I am, and I can't take it back. I can't do anything about it. All I can try to do is do it better. And um, time will tell if I do, you know. Um, so, so in any event, it's a great question. I don't, I don't know the answer to it. Well, I appreciate the sincerity of your answer. Thank you. Yeah. So let's get back to that so, path uh, now that you're yeah, that sorry path. to derail that question, Pete. Yeah. Uh, but that was uh, burning, right. man. I had, to, I had to know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you jump in there anytime, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us about the path that gave you the inspiration. You were taking a different path. Sure. I come out of prison and I did something that now I advise people to avoid. I thought coming out of prison that I was a big shot before I could be a big shot again. I was successful before. Why shouldn't I immediately resume that kind of success right away? Don't people know? I built a $100 million business. I had 500 people working for me. Surely people are going to want to be, they're going to be attracted to me because they're going to want my mojo. They're going to want that. And sure, I've been to prison. I'm damaged goods, but I got what it takes. And I assume that people would be impressed by that. And I tell you, I couldn't have been wronger. No one gave a shit about who I was. All they knew was that I went to prison and maybe I was radioactive. Nobody wants to be around that where God only knows who's watching what you're doing or whatever. So I tried to, I came out of prison with the idea. And again, this was about ego and, and a lack of humility right away. I had this idea that I could step into the batter's box and immediately hit a home run. And when you try to hit too many home runs, you inevitably end up striking out a lot. And I did. And I tried to make believe or hide my past, but of course you can't do that. Everybody Googles everybody. And I had a lot of press, so it was an impossible secret to keep. But I was very, very lucky. I came upon a nonprofit organization that was really attractive to me called Defy Ventures, D-E-F-Y Ventures. They're based in New York, and they're also very, very active in the Bay Area, in San Francisco. And what they do is they work with men and women in and out of prison. They try to train them in entrepreneurialism so that theoretically they can start their own small business and be in control of their economic futures. Uh, I began working for them, and eventually I became the director in New York, 
And it was enormously powerful, satisfying work for me. And it really did my soul a great deal of good to be helping other people to get on their feet and to share my story. The founder of the organization, this amazing woman, she urged me to share my story, to tell my path to being there to, in all the gory details, to talk about you know, what was caused me so much shame and embarrassment. And I did that. And it was incredible what I discovered was that when I started being honest and open and sincere about my past, I discovered the redemptive power of forgiveness, that people were so understanding and so giving and supportive, rather, you know, and I assumed they would all hate me and avoid me at all costs, and just the opposite happened. People really... I guess there's something in them. They like to forgive people and they like uh, that, that story of forgiveness because somehow it's, I guess, inspiring or positive or whatever. But I discovered that people had such a heart and not only just for me, but for other folks who had been through much harder, much worse experiences coming from terrible backgrounds and they were eager to support organizations and to sp and donate money and their time on and on and on to help folks who they knew were going to have a tough time through reentry. And I love the work, but the nature of these nonprofits is such that they what they do is very kind of holistic. They work with a person and they deal with psychological issues and substance abuse issues and family issues and housing and employment. All of that stuff, important, absolutely necessary, but it's very high touch and it doesn't scale. And they mostly work with people who are just ran out of prison. And I couldn't help but think about all the people like myself who had been out for several years for whom there were no organizations to help them at all, and yet they still had the same pain in getting a job because they're of, of, of background checks that would be done with them. The one thing I didn't mention when I was spewing all of those statistics is all of those statistics apply to people who are unemployed. The reality, however, is that people who are employed almost never get rearrested. Almost never get rearrested. They don't have problems at work. They don't go back to prison. They don't screw up when they have a real job. It's a direct correlation between employment and short-circuiting uh, recidivism. And the opposite is equally so. There's a direct correlation between recidivism and unemployment. The point here is, Jobs are a silver bullet. It's as clear cut as that. There's no debate. No one disagrees. The federal government understands it. Every nonprofit understands it. I understand it. So what I decided to do, I got frustrated. I said, let's help the people who've been out a couple of years, who basically have their act together. All they need is one less door slamming in the face. That's where I can do the most good, the most economically and the quickest. That's how I can get a million people jobs. So I, we don't get involved with any of the other stuff. We don't get involved with training and job readiness and psychological things and substance and all these other things. They're important, of course but they don't scale. And I wanted to do something nationally and I wanted to have a big impact because I thought the opportunity existed there both socially as well as on a business level. I thought this was a historically great business opportunity. So we specifically have a narrow point of view of who we're going after, you know, and that's 10 or 20 million people who've been out for a while who are in the job market. And those are the people who do great when they get a job, truly. Studies show that these people generally emerge as the best performers in a job for their employers. And not only that, they stick around longer than people without records. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but these people do better and stick around longer. And if you think about it, you can understand why. Unlike people, a lot of people today, they have no sense of entitlement. They don't think the world owes them a living. 
In fact, they're deeply grateful that someone would take a chance on them and they reward their employer with loyalty that is an inspirational for every other employee in the company. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG 69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. So we work with companies who get that, who need people, but they need great people. And we're able to supply them with a lot of them because we have so many in our community. That is spectacular on so many levels. I think well, that just I, I got your analysis. Great material of- to work with, some amazing people, you know, who, <laughs> deserve, who deserve these chances. That's the real spectacular. Well, and that's the thing. Your comment about scalability Mm -hmm. is spot on because there are a lot of people who do a lot of great things for uh, the recently released population, and we appreciate a lot of people's efforts. But you have a very unique point of view in that in your business successes, you learned about scalability. Yes. And you also... Uh, had a lot of people to pay back. So if, if that had any influence, your, yeah, you know, yeah. like you said, you got your karmic scorecard. Uh, you got a big hole to dig out of and you thought big. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and which is one so, of the reasons why, I mean, we were very, very fortunate. We were chosen by Y Combinator, which is, I guess, pretty much the premier early stage investor. Incubator. Is, incubator program in in Mountain View, California, you know, companies like Dropbox and Airbnb and Reddit and Stripe, they all went through there. And then they they thought that we belonged in there, too. So uh, that was an incredible experience, incredibly supportive. And we received substantial venture capital support having gone through that. So, you know, tremendous. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's lots of there's lots of great people out there for whom, you know, this, the mission and the business resonates. And so let me, I, I, sure. I want to jump in here, Richard, and ask you this then. Why Combinator, as we know, it's, it is the high-end incubator yes. out there. And they don't have to say yes they to rarely anybody. Do. So this goes back to you. Right, yeah, they barely do, right? So not only do you get them to say yes, and then, of course, they do their program and get you in front of those, those investors to get you some money to mm-hmm. keep this going, but uh, one, this is an, uh, it appears to be an obvious idea, but you figured something else out. What was that something else that everybody else didn't get? And then two, how does a, a white collar criminal go to the premier incubator and get them to say yes? Huh. <laughs> yes, to give you new money. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they gave, they gave us money. They invested, and yeah, I mean, I mean, first of all, the answer is they're an amazing organization, and yeah. they have a lot of really smart people who are partners there, and they've done incredibly well. And their business model is amazing, and they've been th- so many different organizations have tried to copy their model, but still, they you know, it is the Harvard, the MIT, the Stanford of uh, globally, uh, you know, and going through that program has done enormous things for us with credibility and access and, you know, and, and to say nothing of all that, you know, that I learned from it, it was a wonderful experience. Um, I think that they are an example of a very enlightened organization that understands, you know, that, you know, A, it's possible to do good business and do good work simultaneously. They're not mutually exclusive. And I think there's a growing awareness that that kind of dynamic or that paradigm can be very, very workable. Um, certainly, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do a bunch of things that have never been done before. And there's a lot that we don't know that we discover. You know, there's a lot of mystery 
that I'm, that gets resolved on a daily basis with us. Plus the fact that you know I'm pretty much just nothing more than a bozo trying to figure out things <laughs> as he goes along. Honestly, so uh, so. Um, but uh, how does someone get in? Uh, I don't think I, I think they understand the nature of incarceration and the criminal justice system there. I don't think that that per se will preclude someone getting in because I certainly made no bones about my background. In fact, that's the lead part of my whole business is, you know, I went through it, I understand it. And, you know, that understanding can, you know, hopefully bring some enlightenment to how to to do it better. Um, I urge anybody, period, across the board, that if you have a startup idea at whatever stage it may be, I urge you to to, to apply because they are looking for people who are smart and clever and interesting and unexpected because that's where they think great success lies. Um, and going through the process, you know, even if you don't get in, there's value to be had. And it's a very cool thing to do. I loved every day of it. I'd like to go through it again. It was kind of like the best parts of going to summer camp and college. And, and it was wonderful, everything about it. Well, the answer to uh, why they would give you the, the dough and uh, in spite of your past is that not only are you uh, presenting a great idea, uh, but you're presenting it with an honesty that takes, I think, a lot of the, it takes a lot of the doubt away. I mean, like you said, you lead with it. And when you talk about the power of people, people and their forgiveness, I think it's not just that people are willing to forgive. It's that human beings love, as much as we love a success story, we love a story of redemption even more. Right. And I, I think that I if you had anything short of absolute sincere honesty, their process notwithstanding, those guys would have picked you apart. 100%. But the reality is that you had a great idea that had an enormously impactive solution, and you came at it with sincerity. And it's an inspiring story. Who doesn't want to get behind that? Well, thank you. I mean, it means a lot to me that you would say that. It was funny. A couple of weeks ago, I was asked to do an AMA, Ask Me Anything, on Reddit. And if you've ever seen that, uh, an AMA, it's, it's online, and there's about nine, I think it's mostly like young guys. They're allowed to be as snarky and as obnoxious as they want to be and as intrusive. And, you know, and it's all done very anonymously on their part, so they feel... You know, it's an opportunity to express all their anger and their whatever. And I, and I went into it, you know, understanding all that. And, you know, and, um, and of course, the, I would say for the most part, 75% of the people who were participating and asking me questions were very understanding and insightful and positive. And 25 or 30%, I felt like they were kind of like jackals waiting to pounce watching the herd for the weak kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the injured calf. And I, you know, they were waiting for me to respond, you know, or, or meet their kind of obnoxiousness with that. And I just wouldn't do it. You know, they would say something and, and I would say, you know, I understand you feeling that way. I, I get it. I, I appreciate your feeling that way. And, you know, every day I feel that way about myself, too. And I'm just doing the best I can. And I understand if you don't buy it or whatever. But, you know, that's nonetheless here I am. And eventually, you know, like you say, I think that's 100 percent true. People love redemption. There's something incredibly human about it, because let's face it and forget about me. Who among us hasn't screwed up? Who among us hasn't made a mistake, the sort that in the wrong place at the wrong time could easily land us in jail? Who among us hasn't had an extra glass of wine or an extra beer and gotten behind the wheel of their car? What businessman does not, from time to time on their tax return, write off a personal dinner or travel or whatever and call it a business expense? They all do. But in the wrong place at the wrong time, any of that sort of behavior is going to put you in jail. 
morality is rarely as black and white as people would like it to be. It's never that simple. I was in a lot of, I met a lot of people who, you know, just screwed up a little bit and just things just kind of went out of control and they, they paid the price. I'm not saying that's me. I was stone guilty. I did bad things and I deserve to be punished. So I'm not speaking about myself. I'm just saying it might be convenient and nice. And there are people who would think, well, if you're locked up, that means you're a bad person. I'm just telling you, these were not necessarily bad people. They're as, they're as good and bad as anybody else. They're human beings. They made a mistake. Do we really want them to have a life sentence? That's the question. Is society served? Are their communities served? Is their family served by their inability to earn a living and take care of their children? Or is it better for them to go out and find an alternative way to earn a living and create new victims, create new cops that are killed unnecessarily, clog up jails? We spent $100 billion on the stupidity and it just don't work. So there's got to be a better way. Richard, we had Shaka Sangur on the show. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he talks. I know him well. I know him well. He's a great man. Yeah, he is. And his belief and he thing he taught me was is all inmates are rehabilitatable. And that's where you start. And if you miss a couple out of that, right. okay. Right. But if you start with that maxim and you stop breaking people's brains by incarcerating them in solitary confinement and you yeah. work on getting them out of the pattern that they're in, yeah. you're yeah. much more enriched as right a nation. That's a myth that people have that there are certain people who not only deserve to be in prison, but want to be there, or that's the only place that they feel at home. That's like a popular kind of myth that sounds good over a couple of beers at the bar, but the reality of it is it's not true. I'm not talking about people who are criminally insane or whatever that means. Sure. I'm not talking about that. I never came across that. I've never met anybody like that. And certainly I've read about and heard about, we've all seen incidences of people acting so awfully. I have no idea what to do with them. I don't know. Should we throw away the key? I have no idea. And I don't, it's not, you know, who the hell am I? But I will tell you that that's less than 1% of 1% of the population that goes through criminal justice. The reality of it is, is nobody wants to go through that. No one wants to be incarcerated. It's not home for anyone. People will always rather have a lifestyle that involves freedom to be with their friends, their family, their children, to watch what they want on TV, to be in a clean place to have good food, to be with your loved ones, to be, have a relationship. All of these things are far stronger human needs than any that supposedly, you know, these aberrant personalities supposedly need or want, which they don't. So I've never come across it. I've worked for years now with folks with records. I have gotten to know, I can't tell you how many murderers that I've met who are among the most inspiring people I've ever met, who, if you hear their story, you would go, you know something, I would have done the same thing as you did. And yet, despite spending decades behind bars and being thrown away, essentially, and forgotten, who have come out and who still have a belief that life matters, that other human beings matter, and that they can make something of their life, you meet people like that, and if that doesn't touch your soul, you're the one you know, who's got the issue. They don't. You know, when you start recognizing that these people are human beings and you can touch them that way, sometimes it's going to shock you at what you discover. I, I urge everybody just to give people a chance and find out. You know, I, I know I sound like a little hippy-dippy-ish and, you know, a bleeding heart liberal, and I am all of that. But, you know, it's... it's Interview over. <laughs> <laughs> No, listen, I think that if I can just clarify a couple of things, because I know some of our audience is going to disagree with a couple of points, but here's what we can agree on. There are some folks who need society to be protected from. You yeah. know, there are some people who do bad things who need to go away, and it's just that they don't operate in society in a way that we expect them to, and they hurt people. 
and those folks need to go away. So I agree. just to satisfy the people out there who are shaking their fist and going, hey. Um, but what you're doing, though, is you're saying there, we're talking about a population of 70 million people yeah. in this country who have a criminal record, who deserve an opportunity to make a living, to be a contributor, to – operate in an environment where they can have some, not just a few bucks to put food on the table, but some dignity. And everybody does deserve that. And if we're talking about a population that needs to be put away because the rest of us need to be protected from them, that is such a minuscule percentage of 70 million people. Well, at the risk, so, at the risk of, of offending both of you and your listenership even a little bit more, let me tell you what I was referring to when I'm talking about murderers <laughs> that I've met. I've met women who were working two jobs because their husband ran away long ago and had a kid or two that they had to take care of and were working at miserable, low-paying jobs. And while they were away working at these jobs to put food on the table for their kids because they knew that was their responsibility... Their boyfriend was abusing their children, their daughters. And they lived with that for a while. And they tried to get help. And they called the police. And nothing happened and nothing would improve. And eventually, they said enough. And their maternal instinct took over. And they did what they had to do. And I don't know about your mother, but my mother would have done the same exact thing. And that's what I'm talking about, about being inspired. And that's what people don't know. And that people are driven to extremes, not because they're defect. Yes, are there people who are, who, who I, I, as I said, I have no idea what to do with those folks. I don't have an answer. But I, that's, that represents, as you point out, a infinitesimal percentage of the lives, the families, the communities that continue to be destroyed needlessly when there's such better approaches that actually work. And I want to tell you something, because if you're going to invoke your Orange County conservative listenership, let me tell you something. I hear from the Koch brothers, representatives of theirs. In one day, I received calls from them at the same day that I received calls from Senator Cory Booker's office. These are two as politically divergent as you could possibly be. But the Koch brothers are highly interested in this space because they recognize that the system doesn't work and it's an economic drain and it's killing this country. So let me just say that this is not just, you know, the purview of liberal East Coast, you know, whatever. This is something, a growing awareness that almost everybody except our current administration understands. And there's a much better way to do it. But in any event, I have respect for everybody's opinion. And I just hope that the folks who are quick to judge themselves or their children don't get into trouble. You're absolutely right. When you look at stories like that, Elena Nessler, 1993, walks into a courthouse in Sonora, California, and shoots Daniel Driver in the head. That sounds horrible. And then you realize he's a multiple-time convicted child molester, and she was afraid he was going to get out again and hurt her kid or some other kid again. Yeah. Someone's there's, got a job there's, for There's her. often a backstory yeah. to these situations that you're never going to hear. But do you know what happens when people go? There are lots of organizations that will take folks into prisons where you can actually see what life is, and you get to meet some of these folks. And you're meeting people that you'd never thought you would ever meet. Murderers, rapists, whatever. Terrible, terrible people. And then when you actually have an opportunity to hear their story and their side of things, it's transformational when you discover you know, that what they went through and what brought them there. And they're not defective human beings. It's a defective environment that they were born into and you know, had no choice about. And... Maybe they didn't act the way we would like them to act, but you know, when you really hear the story and you open yourself up to them and you open your heart a little bit, you realize this person really had never a chance. And you know, that, that saddens me a lot, just to think about it. But in any event, 
I urge people, if you have a chance to go into prison, you want to do something amazing, go in there. There's lots of organizations that will bring you in there and to meet people and hear their stories. And you're just not going to believe it. You're going to walk out a different person, I guarantee. I think also the act of actually walking into a prison gives a person some perspective. Yeah, yeah. It's, because it's, every door that they lock behind you, and there are several, but every one that they lock behind you as you walk in there to go to the day room where you're going to address folks or even just the visiting area, that gives you perspective. It sure does. And it helps you to understand a little bit about somebody who's in there and what somebody goes through, if only a sliver of the experience. Yeah. But the thing is, you know how we got here is that it's easy to get people all pumped up by campaigning on a platform that you're tough on crime. And by talking about how your opponent is not as tough on crime as you are, and you're going to pass a bunch of laws that are tough on crime. And that's easy for voters to go, yeah, I like that guy. I like a guy who's tough on crime. And then they're passing legislation that's making it difficult for people to just recover from a transgression or stay out of jail. Yeah. And or, uh, you know, something related to all the way back to things like cutting music programs in public schools where we're doing a disservice to young people who are trying to figure it out. And that's having repercussions, enormous well, ones. So, yeah, there's no question about what you're saying, but the reality of it is, and, and I have seen, you know, it's been, let's see, 12 years or 13 years since I was released from prison, I've seen a big difference in attitude. The cultural zeitgeist is definitely changing in, in a positive way. Uh, it used to be that no politician would expend political capital to come out any way but tough on crime, because that would be a sure way to lose an election. And you had guys like Reagan, who, you know, was trying to win the war on drugs. And you had governors in New York, like Rockefeller, three strikes in Iraq, out. And that's where you saw this explosion in the prison populations. Well, guess what? We didn't win the war on drugs. That's another war that we engaged in that we had no chance of winning. Arguably, we're losing it terribly now. So longer sentences and more prison cells didn't work. Three strikes you're out meant that the third time, even if it was a minor transgression, you could spend the next 40 years in prison. It's barbaric at the best. So that approach just hasn't worked. And most Republicans in Congress would agree with that and, and are you know, considering lots of different ways to much more intelligently, forget about humanely, much more economically address these problems in a way that works. If, if we spent a tenth of what we spend on incarceration, on, re, on actual rehabilitation, on training people on skills that are actually marketable when they get out, rather than just flipping a hamburger for minimum wage, we're going to give people a chance. And what's going to end up happening is we're going to save money along the way. We're going to save money on the $100,000 a year it takes to reincarcerate somebody. And we're going to have fewer victims and fewer cops killed and fewer wives who, who can't afford to pay their kids because their husband is in jail. And fewer communities like Chicago, where you walk down the street and you don't see black men uh, 25 years old anymore because about half of them are in jail or in prison. So there's so many advantages to doing it the right way, even on a purely economic basis, like the Koch brothers you know, are looking at things, certainly. There's compelling reasons to do it. And what's amazing is, is that once these people are employed, they actually do better at the jobs than folks without records. They excel. So business benefits then. The corporate culture improves. People are proud of the companies they work for because they took a principled stand. This is what I do all day. I talk to these big companies. And I'm shocked when I discover one after another large company that understands this. And they understand that it's good business. So we're seeing positive change. I'm not here to report doom and gloom, just the opposite. 
I want to, we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction, not quickly enough, but nonetheless, there's improvement. Well, we got a lot of work to do to get to a million people uh, with jobs, but yeah. uh, I can speak for Pete, and, and, and I'll say this, Richard, we're behind you 100%. Thank like you so much. You get there means and we'll a lot do to anything me. that we can to give you a hand. If you are one of the 70 million people out there with a criminal record and you are having a hard time or uh, curious to see what your opportunities are, I encourage you to go to 70millionjobs.com. That's seven zero, the word million, the word jobs, dot com. 70millionjobs.com to see the good work that Richard and his team are doing. And Richard, thanks a million, man. I, I, like I said, we're behind you 100%. Whatever we can do to help further the mission we want to do, because that's the America I want to live in. Yeah. Amen, brother. Thank you both so much for your time. And thank you for your listeners to hang in there and to, to hear me talk and tell my story. And I, I, ha, I have every expectation that things will continue improving as long as there are guys like you out there. So thanks so much for having me. Terrific. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate you very much.